I uh, actually asked Pastor specifically if I could teach tonight. Um, and so there won't be any music. I'm sorry, Joe. Joe was looking forward to it all day. <laughs> Good thing you didn't say anything, right? <laughs> um, did everybody get a sheet? There we go. Are there any more sheets? No. Did anyone else not get a sheet? I thought If anyone else needs a sheet, you'll be right here in the front, so you just have to walk past everybody. All right. So, have you guys ever read? <laughs> Give it a second. There it is. Have you guys ever read Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers and just kind of thought, okay, now what does this have to do with me? Yes. Yeah. So I'm not the only one. I, I just don't get it. Numbers. <laughs> Diana has a death cue for numbers. <laughs> but, uh, okay, well, tonight we're actually going to talk about that. And we're going to look at more specifically, more specifically, how to. Uh, I really hate this thing. Yeah, I know, it's for the recording. Uh, we're going to look at more specifically how to understand that. So, um, we'll be talking about the law, understanding Christian freedom, and biblical interpretation. It's kind of a two-parter thing, and please, if I say anything that confuses you, please ask, okay, because this is, the, the books of the law is what the entire rest of the Bible really has as its root. So if you don't correctly understand it, you're not going to correctly understand the Gospels or um, the Prophets or the books of history, etc. So. So the first thing is that um, the books that we call the books of the law are Genesis through Deuteronomy, and they were actually written to be one single unit. Uh, in other words, when you read Genesis and it ends and you start reading Exodus, it's not meant for you to switch. Okay, this is a different book. It's meant for you to see it as um, part B. See what I mean? Because it'll pick up on the same themes as Genesis started on. And you see the same themes going throughout it. For instance, Genesis shows how God created something that was faultless and perfect, and then how people mess that up. And then it shows God's plan to restore the people. And then Exodus picks up with God drawing the people out to be his people in restoration. See what I mean? And Leviticus shows, shows them how to live separate from the, from the nations, that kind of different, those kinds of different things. So even though they're different books, they're one unit. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, the second thing to notice is when people talk about the Old Testament, what do they talk about? The law, right? But the law is only a small thing. The law is actually uh, based off of a much bigger thing called the promise. And Galatians talks about the, the, the promise a lot, but what we're going to look at is Genesis. Starting in chapter 3, verse 15. And uh, it says this. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The, God is talking to, um, to Satan who was, we'll just say, manifesting himself through a snake. And God uses this, um, what he's saying here, as, as prophecy of what would come later. Satan, through his work, would bruise our heel. But at the last lap, God would win the victory when Jesus would come through man and bruise his head. See what I mean? So it was foreshadowing something, or foreshadowing something that would come much later, but was still a promise nevertheless. And it's important to note that Adam and Eve deserved death as soon as they sinned in the Garden of Eden, but God spared them and gave them this promise that one day he would free them. So that promise is again talked about in chapter 9, verse 27 of Genesis. So people go off, and temporarily God withdraws his presence from humanity completely. 
and he doesn't really talk to them um, and just kind of uh, leads them to their own own, own uh, thing. And some people still worship God, but a large majority of them harden their hearts against God. And so what happens is eventually they're so sinful and so wicked that God decides that he needs to bring punishment. But from all these people, there's a single man who God sees as um, following him. And this is the person we know as Noah. So he saves Noah in the flood, but with Noah, he also saves his three sons. And that's where, where we pick up in chapter 9 because they're getting off of the ark. Okay. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Um, and this might seem like it's kind of just thrown in there, except for when you look at the way translations have done this verse from the Hebrew. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous in the wording. It could be either him being Japheth or him being God, and let him, whoever this him is, dwell in the tents of Shem. So some of your t uh, uh, translations will say, let Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem. But then when we read the rest of Genesis, and Exodus, and Leviticus, it doesn't make any sense. Until we see that it could, it could also be ascribing to, ascribed to God, and may God enlarge Japheth and let God dwell in the tents of Shem. In which case, that makes sense. Who did Israel come through? Shem. Israel was born through Shem. God told back then in chapter 9, I'm going to give my presence to your later descendants through the descendants of Shem. See what I mean? And so now, ah, now we have the next step in the promise. And it seems like God forgets it again. Like maybe God's, God's grown, you know, just forgotten about what he said until we get to chapter 12. And God reminds people, you know, I didn't forget my promise. And we picked up in chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now who was Abram's great, 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 great grandfather? Shem. Shem. May God dwell in the tents of Shem. So that's where, that's where we come to here. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and let him, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now how, through Abraham... Are all people of the world blessed? Because through Abraham was born Israel, and through Israel was born Judah, and through Judah was born Jesus. And Jesus would come to set people free from their sins. Amen. See, so we have these subtle little 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 um, tidbits throughout Genesis showing God's coming promise. But yet we reach the end of Genesis, and it's not fulfilled. Then we get into Exodus, and the situation has deteriorated, deteriorated even farther, and the people of Israel are actually in captivity. So then God shows how powerful he is to set people free from that captivity. Now he is actually the master of everything, not the Pharaoh of Egypt. So then we get to Leviticus, and he shows them how to live differently than all these pagan nations. Then we get to Numbers, and we see that they fell God yet again, yet God's promise remains that he would still send a savior to the world, Jesus Christ. Then we get to Deuteronomy, where Moses... Uh, in one of his prophecies near the end of the book, talks about the coming Messiah, who would be a prophet like Moses. Um, and then we see Jesus, who is that prophet, uh, come in the book of Matthew. So, so God's promise of salvation came before the law. The Old Testament is not rooted in the law of Moses. It is rooted in the promise of God that he gave to Adam, Noah, and Abraham. Okay, That's the first thing to notice with, with the Old Testament. The second thing to notice is that people were saved before the law was ever given. Okay, Romans 4, 3. And I'll, now just roll with me. This is going to get a little bit confusing, but hopefully I'll, I'll kind of explain it, you know, where you can get what I'm saying. Romans 4, 3 says... For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now how could it be counted to him as righteousness if he couldn't be saved in the first place? See what I mean? It, it's, it's nonsensical. What he's saying here is that salvation came before the law was ever given. So then that brings the question, why was the law given if people could be saved without the law? And Just hold on a second, we'll get there. The law was given to enhance the promise so God could dwell with his people. See, before the law was given, some people still knew God, but it was harder to know God. And God wanted to make it easier to know him. So he gave the law. This is what I am like. 
and this is what I want you to be like, and this is what will come later through, uh, through my son Jesus. See what I mean? He wanted to show them something to enrich the promise to make it better. Because the promise in and of itself is good, but it's insufficient. If all that God gave was a promise, then we really have nothing to cling to as hope without fulfillment. It's just a dead hope. But God gave the law as an expectation of what would come through the promise. Does that make sense? So then well, let's look at um, Exodus 29.45. Exodus 29, 45 says this. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. See, God could no longer dwell with people ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Why could God no longer sin, dwell with, with, with people because of the fall? He won't dwell with sin. He won't dwell with sin. Romans tells us, in other words, that the wages or what is due, what the result is of sinning, is a separation from God. Okay. Death is. Right, and if there is a separation from God, then there really can't be new life. So why couldn't God have just simply killed us and then in the resurrection resurrected us to heaven? Because there would have been no forgiveness for our sins. See, our, our damnation, what we, what we deserved was eternal death and separation from God. Because that is the wages of sin. See, God needed to restore people somehow. Luckily, God had this all planned before he ever created the earth, so he had his bases covered. <laughs> um, and so then people ask, well, why did he wait so long? Because God has his perfect timing for everything. And because of his patience, we've all drawn a benefit from it. Because God decided to be patient, we now have the law to depend on. We have the prophets. We have the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus. We have all these different things that God, because God was patient in sending his son, we are benefited from it. So whereas some had to go through a lengthy process of not understanding these things and not having the Bible, it is to our benefit. And so that later generations may also know of the goodness of God. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. It takes us to the next part here. Um, the law never saved anyone. <coughs> some people believe that following the Old Testament law had some special effect and that somehow it would set people in, into, into salvation. But the problem is that the law didn't ever bring salvation. It only brought death. Okay, It brought captivity. So Romans 9, 30 through 32 says this. 9, 30 through 32. It, it should be on your sheet. If it's not, let me know. Okay? Uh, 9, 30 through 32. What shall we say then that Gentiles, us... Who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But the Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching the law. Why? Why did the Jews not attain salvation and we now have attained salvation? What, what happened? Verse 32. Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They assumed that following the Old Testament law would somehow bring them salvation. So they lost out on salvation because their faith was no longer in God, who gave the law to show his character, but rather on doing the works itself. In other words, people tried to make it about their perfection. Does that make sense? Yeah. If there's any questions, stop me and, and ask, okay? Oh, and then also we're going to look at Galatians 2. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. In other words, the Old Testament never law never brought anybody to salvation because the salvation was by faith in God, not by faith in the works of the law. Okay? All right? So then with all this being said, it inevitably brings up the question, why was the law even given? The law was given for three main purposes. There are other purposes, but I'll, I'll break them down, okay? The first reason was um, so that in sin would increase. I know this sounds a little bit circuitous, but basically God, in giving the law and showing what was right and wrong, enticed people, enticed people to sin more because in showing who God was, they were more able to rebel against him. Does that make sense? 
Does that kind of make sense? I'll read where that's found in Galatians, and uh, remember to, to ask me if I, if I say anything confusing, okay? Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Or, or it, in, in the Greek, it, it reads more like, it was given to increase the transgression. Okay? Yeah. Um, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. In other words, the law was given for a temporary time to cause people to sin more until Jesus would come. Does that make sense? So then there was a second reason why, why the law was given. Because if the law was only given to make people sin, that doesn't make much sense, does it? It doesn't. So then we get to Galatians 3, uh, chapter, I mean, chapter 3, verse uh, 21. And Paul gives a second reason. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? In other words, is the law that God gave to Moses contradicting the promise that he gave to Adam and Eve and to Noah and to Abraham? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. So the second reason, the second reason is to bring in awareness of sin so that you can know whether something is or is not wrong. Does that make sense? Yes. So then the third reason is found in verse 20, uh, chapter 5, let's see, uh, chapter, oh, let's read 20, verse 24 first. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. See, it guarded us, it helped protect us, it, it leaded us to what would one day come through Christ, and that is why Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Okay? So then that takes us to... Um, Chapter 5 of Galatians, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So now we get a third purpose of the law, to give moral guidance. Instructions for the day-to-day. -day. Okay? Um, and Galatians then goes on to say some more stuff that we're going to look at in a second. But for the time being, I want to flip over to um, 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And this is important to remember when we're reading through the books of the law because sometimes we get a little bit bogged down in numbers, huh, Diana? Huh, <coughs> Diana? We get, we get bogged down in numbers. Right. <laughs> uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. Um, all scriptures breathed out by God or inspired by God. It was uh, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke through people, basically. And profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now remember, the entire New Testament was written by people who were using the Old Testament. So in other words, they'd read something in the Old Testament, and then they would say, this is how it applies to you today. For instance, read through Leviticus 19, and then read through the book of James. See what I mean? He has basically taken Leviticus 19 for you and made it easier. Does that make sense? So, remember that when you read through the New Testament, it all came from the Old Testament somewhere. You just got to look hard enough. Um, <clears throat> so, okay. Those, uh, that there is a fragment of the uh, Greek manuscripts, and this is this here is from the Byzantine uh, Empire. So, just thought it was interesting. It doesn't have anything to do with the lesson. <laughs> uh, the law was given to Israel for a limited time. So, okay, who was it not given to? Us, right? Yes. The law was given to Israel, not to the New Testament church. Okay? That's important. Now, I'm not saying it's not, it's not it doesn't have a purpose. I'm saying it no longer has direct bearing over how we do and do not live. I'll give you an example. The tithes were instituted by Abraham before the law was ever given. True. And then it was once again validated. Val, val, what am I thinking? Validated. validated. Thank you. Yeah. It was once again validated through uh, Jacob, who would then be I, I, uh, Israel later on. Okay. And then it was also a part of the law. But then Paul once again mentions it in the New Testament and says, hey, it is right to do these things. He talks about the teachers getting getting their, their pay. He talks about pastors being worthy worthy of it. He talks about you know all these different things. So what can we do, what can we deduce from tithes? That tithing is not simply a, a a part of the covenant given to Moses. That it is a part of every believer's life in submitting their finances to God. Yeah. That's how we, 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 could, we could deduce from that. So the law was given to Israel for a limited time. God temporarily allowed it. In other words. 
animals had nothing to blame. It was the people who sinned. We deserve death. But God temporarily allowed an animal to die in our place until Christ would come so that we didn't have to be killed and that we could be in restoration with God. Does that make sense? However, with that being said, the law became obsolete. In other words, Genesis to Deuteronomy no longer has hold of whether or not you are obeying God or not. Okay, Does that make sense? Whether you are obeying the Old Testament law, Genesis to Deuteronomy, does not mean you are obeying God anymore. Does that make sense? We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, make, I'll say it in another way further down. But basically, the law says um, – what's, what's a good example of the law? So should we do the Passover thing? Okay, the Passover. That's a great example. The law says to do the Passover, and if you don't, you actually are excommunicated from, excommunicated from Israel. Did you know that we here do not celebrate the Passover and we are not excommunicated from the church? Did you know that? Now, there's a few reasons for that. The first reason is because Jesus' resurrection is our Passover, so the Lord's Supper is the Pas is the new Passover. But then there's other reasons for that, too, that being that we don't follow any of the feasts of the Jews. Go ahead. Right. Mike. <laughs> That's Mike. The Jews still don't believe in Christ. Right. Right. And we'll come to this later on. But there, there got something going that America was the new Israel, and so that our nation's prosperity would hinge on our ability to confirm, to conform to Genesis to Deuteronomy. But actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. Or actually, a lot more simple than that. When people submit their lives to God, God blesses them, right. mm -hmm. sure. regardless of what the nation's doing. And the second part of that is that Israel, Israelites are not saved simply because they are Jewish. That's right. In fact, I'll go a step further. If someone is still practicing Judaism today, they are still not saved. Amen. Does that make sense? Because yeah. people get really confused about the law and how it applies to us today. So just keep out and keep keep up with me. And if, if if I didn't answer this part enough, Lauren, just make a mark there. And if I don't answer it good enough later, we'll come back to it. Okay? Um. Oh, I think there was something I wanted to say from there. Um, Circuitous. And yes, it's real. Okay, so then that takes us to this one. We are no longer held to the law because it is obsolete. Hebrews talks in great lengths about this. Um, I'm actually kind of still surprised why people still stick with holding people to a law when Hebrews went to such great lengths to show us how free we are from the law. Hebrews chapter 8. That's just such an area of pride that we can prove that we're one. Mm. Through our works. Yeah. And so then we begin to demand that from other people. I will give you an example. I will give you a perfect example of the law for today. Okay. You might notice that I, that I don't wear suits on, on stage, and I used to wear suits. There's a reason why. This There's a two-part reason why I do not wear suits on, suits on stage anymore. The first reason is because the Jehovah's Witness wear their suits all the time. I don't want to do anything that associates me with the Jehovah's Witness. They are liars and they are thieves, and I will not associate myself with them. In fact. Okay, second reason. Second reason why I do not wear, wear it is because the priests had to wear certain clothes when they went into the tabernacle to, to serve. I have been set free from the law, so I purposely wear commoner clothes because I am free from the law, and as a testament to other people that I am free from the law. Now, am I saying that people, nobody should ever wear a suit on stage? That's just stupid, and I didn't say that at all. And in fact, in different circumstances, I would wear a suit on the tie. I, I, wear a suit on the stage. But I don't, given the current circumstances. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13 says this. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, broken. Passed away, thrown aside. It's, it's no good anymore. What is he talking about? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The books of the law. The law. That's what he's talking about. And when Jesus came, it made that obsolete. Okay. Now, what does this mean for us? We are free from the law. We have been set free from the law. What that means is that our salvation is based solely on Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, it was before... But they had to do something, a dead activity, to point forward to what would later come in the hope that it would one day come. But now we look back to what has already come and we proclaim they were saved by Jesus. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
kind of? Okay. So, Hebrews 8.13. Dad, I don't know how you stand this thing. I hate it. Quit fooling with it because it'll hurt my ear so much. Yeah, it will. <laughs> <laughs> so then that takes people to the other stage. Okay. So if I'm free from the law, I can do whatever the heck I want, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. Mm -hmm. If we actively live as lawless, it's a sign that we aren't really saved in the first place. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean? If you sin, no. We all sin. And, and John says that if anyone says he's not a sinner, he's a liar. Mm -hmm. We are all sinners. Even after salvation, we still sin. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is people who justify their sin. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and do this because, hey, Jesus. Hey, Jesus, what? That doesn't mean you get to go out and party. That doesn't mean you get to go out and get yourself wasted. So, I mean, these are just stupid, foolish things. In fact, Paul says that the sign of the Holy just a second, that the sign of the Holy Spirit having worked in a person is that they're being renewed, that they're being that the Holy Spirit is working patience in them, and kindness and gentleness, that they will no longer be given to the to the lusts of the flesh, but that they will be given to the desires of the Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, who dwells in us as we submit to Him. Joe. I know when I was first become a Christian, um, you gotta remember you're still in the law. Um, I saw a good, uh, a good guy in church that I really looked up to, and he did some things that uh, were today would be considered a sin. And I said, you know what? I think that's not bad. Uh, he does it. Look at the holy man he is. Mm -hmm. And now, now I understand that don't follow him. <laughs> you follow Christ, right? And the law or whatever it is. You fall right. Faith. So then that takes us to uh, Romans 6, 1 through 7. Paul pretty much addressed all these things that we have questions about today. The problem is that when we read it, we don't understand it. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, isn't that what I just asked? Paul did too. Now, let, now let's look at the answer. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we still live in it? How can we claim that we are freed by grace and then still live in sin? You don't do it. See what I mean? And so what was happening back then is the same thing that's happening nowadays. People, well, I'm free from the law. Mm -hmm. And then you have other people on the other side of the fence saying, well, I'm, 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 I can't just live however the heck I want. So people go to extremes. On one, tent, on one side, they say, well, I'm just going to read the Old Testament law and I'm going to yell at people and, and make sure they all conform to it. And then other people say, I'm not even going to touch the Old Testament. I'm just going to read the Gospels and the Epistles. Well, see what I mean? See what I mean? Extremism, they don't even resolve the issue. They just avoid the issue. So then in verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self is crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. And then we hop down to verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death into life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. See? So should we live however we want? No, the very opposite. In fact, by our faith in God, we will be changed. By our faith in God, we will be changed, not by our perfection. By so, yeah. our faith in Jesus Christ, because God has given power to Jesus. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. But Jesus is God, so. Yeah. So then that takes us to what about the law? Well, first off, Jesus is our priest. And second off, he is our sacrifice. Those are two really important things. You read through the books of the law, and whenever you get to go to the priest, just just until you get a handle of the Old Testament law, because sometimes there's variations, cross that out and put Jesus. Okay? 
just until you get a handle of the Old Testament law. Once you get a hang of it, you'll understand that sometimes he's talking more about church function, and other times he's talking about um, Jesus, and it, you just kind of have to um, pay attention to context. So Jesus is our priest and our, and our sacrifice. In other words, whenever you get to a place where it says sacrifice this, that, or the other thing, say Jesus. Does that make sense? Because Jesus fulfilled that. Okay. So then, uh, why did why did it have to be Jesus? Two two parts. He, it had to be a human, and it had to be God. First reason, it had to be a human. Why? Because who sinned? People. Humans. People sinned. So therefore, a, a person had to die. But it couldn't just be any person because it had to be a sinless person, which brings up the idea of a kinsman redeemer. In other words, someone who does something in your place. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Human. However, this was not good enough because that still leaves us with the problem that it is not a sinless person. And also, we didn't sin against ourselves, we sinned against God. Therefore, it had to be God because only God could forgive us because it was, it's God's wrath that is against us. See what I mean? And since God is the only sinless one, it had to be God. Does that make sense? So it had to be, it had to be God, but he did have to come in, 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 as a human, fully human, so that he could die in our place. See what I mean? Yeah. Kind of makes sense? Okay. So that makes us the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We no longer meet in a certain sacred place. We are a certain sacred place, and we take us wherever we go. So let that be a lesson to you that you don't allow any evil thing in your heart or in your life because you are the temple. See, so what people do is they get this holy place mentality. I'm not going to cuss and swear at church. But when I'm at work, I'm going to cuss and swear. No, 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 no. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. You are. You can't just take it off because you left a building. Right. See what I mean? Yeah. It's um, the, the, the stuff is, is important because God went to great lengths. Even though he was the one who was wronged, he took great lengths to make sure that we could get back in communion with him. It's kind of important. It's kind of a big deal. Yes. And when you read the law, realize that it's not about binding people. It's about setting them free. That's right. Okay, it just points forward to something. It is no longer outward purification, but inward dedication that makes us clean. In other words, you're going to read in the law how it says about discharges and about different sins, I mean, not just sins, diseases and different things, and how it made people unclean. But that's not the factor anymore because it's not about that ritual purity that makes you clean. It's about Christ in your heart. And you putting your faith in Christ. Does that make sense? Yes. Does that make sense? So how are we ritually pure? How are we pure to God? When we submit our lives to God. And when we do sin, we go, we take it to, the, to our great high priest, who is Jesus. Because his sacrifice is sufficient for all time. Once again, he knows. It's like, it's like Pastor always says, you know, the Bible explains these things, but when we don't read them, we just kind of make stuff up. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Anyways. Um. So right and wrong is still right and wrong, though. Just because we're set free from the law doesn't mean that God's character has changed. In other words, let me, let me show you an example. The law says not to, not to uh, uh, kill, right? It says don't murder people, right? So, does that mean we shouldn't murder people now? Yeah. yeah. But it's in the law, and we're free from the law. But morality is still morality. Yes. Does that make sense? Exactly. Does that, does that, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Now, there's some things that, oh, just saying, there's some things that don't directly relate anymore. Like, for instance, um, they would cut themselves, and they would get, mark themselves with certain things and whatnot because of pagan, uh, 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 pagan rituals. You know what I mean? To, it would be assigned to their gods. They would mark themselves up. In fact, a, uh, I was telling the young, young group about this. It, uh, recently, an Egyptian uh, uh, corpse was found from right around the time of Moses that had the earliest tattoo printings that we found. And what were these tattoos? What were, what were these tattoos about? Any any ideas? They're gods. Yeah. See what I mean? So that brings so much, such new light to the to the Bible, where it says, "Don't mark yourself and cut yourself and, and, and do your beard and, like this." Why does he say that? Because that's how these pagans were doing it to worship their fake gods. God was so particular about not being conformed to the world that He didn't even let them set up their tents a certain way. 
Because he wanted them to abstain from the ways of the world. Why? Because he wanted to dwell with his people. Say, so do you had your hand up first in the normal? Well, it's just, you said morality, but it's getting right down to what is God's standard. Right. He set us a standard. It's not that he uh, absolved the standard when Jesus was here. Jesus fulfilled right. the standard. Right. And he's the one who looked to for the guidance. Right. In fact, the Bible says it is impossible to fulfill the law yourself, to, 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 to be able to do the things. Not all reason. Oh, I just, in the Bible, I forgot what it said, but it says you will not be framed in the I, uh, what are we talking about? I, I, Michael, I can't remember what the Bible was reading. You will not defame your body. And your body. At, as it applies to, um, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. But once again, the wording there is, is kind of translation specific. The original word is an ambiguous kind of word that means marking. And what, what, is in, in view in that whole passage there is he's talking about a bunch of different things that um, pagans were doing to celebrate their to, to worship their god. But remember, we're free from the law. So even if yeah, but we're still not supposed to be free from the body. No, not necessarily, because the New Testament doesn't say anything about that. It says not to do things for the reason. For the reason. Well, why do you think the reason? What do you think they're for now? Why? Well, now, hold on, though. That's not quite fair. Some people get tattoos and have verses on their arms. Some people put the name of God on their arms. No. Some people put the names of the name of God on their forehead. See, I mean, it's not so simple as it was back then, because tattoos back then were about pagan worship. Now they're not. It also says right next to where it says that, Norval, it also says about not cutting the, cutting the edges of your beard. You cut the edges of your beard and, and how you have your hair. See what I mean? We, we can't, we're not held to that anymore, though, because we're not Jews. See what I mean? That's right. We're under the New Testament. Right. Yeah. I think it is in the New Testament. Yeah. yeah. Well, without a reference, it's hard to. That's right. But my moral of the story being, so how do we know if something is right and wrong then? How do we know? What's the standard then? We'll get to that in just a second on your sheets. We'll, we'll, we'll come right down to it. Okay. So, but one thing to notice is what Jeremiah the prophet said. Now, this is an incredibly important passage that has some fulfillment now. And its inter eternal implications will be fulfilled at the resurrection of our bodies. Jeremiah chapter 31. And this verse, you're going to want to circle it and write it down and just memorize the heck out of it. Because this is one, this is really one of those one of those verses that it transcends and it just really clarifies. Jeremiah 31. Verse 31. And uh, this is just this is just a good one. Behold. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Did, did, did he do that? Did he make that new covenant? Yes, he did. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. He's specifying, not like the one I gave to Moses. My covenant that they broke, that I was, um, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make the, with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In other words, the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is going to empower the New Testament church exactly. so that he can guide them into morality and into holy living and into evangelism and give them power for the new age to give to get out to people. Yes. When, you, when, when there's a church with no Holy Spirit, there's a church with no, no power, and there's a church that doesn't have a focus. Without the Holy Spirit working in and through us, we can't fulfill our purpose. I, mean, I, I want you to think about this right quick. God came to earth in Jesus. He walked for 30 some odd years and did his ministry. During that time, the apostles did not receive the Holy Spirit. They did not receive the Holy Spirit. Right. That's three years of ministry that they went without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And then, Jesus died. They still didn't receive the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus was resurrected. They still didn't receive it. Then Jesus spent about two months 
revealing himself to, to people and establishing what would later be the church. He still did not receive the Holy Spirit. Then he ascends into heaven and says, go to Jerusalem and wait. So they wait there for another 40 days before the Holy Spirit is ever given. Did, did you ever stop to wonder why? Luke shows us when Jesus came, it says that the Holy Spirit empowered him to do his ministry because he was doing something, right? right. He came to do something. So then the, whole, the apostles couldn't do their next step, step B in the process, the part where we do something. They couldn't do it until the Holy Spirit was given because the Holy Spirit was the one who empowered them and gave them direction for the start of the church. So what changed between point A and point B that we no longer need the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us today? And the answer is nothing. Nothing has changed. It is still the last days, just as it was when Paul was here, just as it was when Jesus ascended. It's been the last days ever since Jesus. And in those last days, the prophet Joel says that God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh, man and woman, rich and, uh, rich and poor, slave and free. You go down the list, all people are going to receive the Holy Spirit. When we limit the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we limit God's work in our lives. Remember, the pastor was talking about, he called it the funnel of ministry. Basically, think of a funnel and, and, and with all the qualifications you give God. I'm not going to minister to Hispanics. I don't like them. I'm not going to minister to the poor. I don't like them. I'm not going to minister to this person because they, they made me mad. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, so your funnel gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. But the start of that funnel is this. I'm not going to let the Holy Spirit work through me. Where the Holy Spirit is not working, there will be racism. There will be sexism. There will be anger. There will be bitterness. There will be jealousy. There will be envy. Why? Because those are the works of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Paul already told us about this in Galatians, but for whatever reason, we, we skip what he says there and say, oh, God's doing a work in me. You know, he's just taking his time. Right. That is true. But we still need to submit to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that he may guide us and direct us to a new direction rather than coming to the same services every Sunday and doing the same things every Sunday. Yeah. Come on. Well, Michael, you got to be willing to accept it. Right. The Holy Spirit. Right. Because you can give it yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. At arm's length. Yeah. <coughs> and sometimes what people do is very tragic because it just makes it harder later on. Sometimes what people do is they they submit to God and the, and the Holy Spirit starts moving through them and then they just I don't know what they just kind of bugger out. Maybe they got tired of it. Maybe uh, maybe they just got bogged down with the troubles of the life. I I don't know. Whatever comes by and they just kind of teeter off and then it makes it harder later on. See what I mean? It makes it harder for us later on. Um, so anyways, I spent too long on that point. The New Testament is not a new Old Testament. In other words, he's not get, Paul does not give us new lists of commands. He's showing you this is what is congruent with the Holy Spirit, and this is what is not. This is what the Holy Spirit produces, and this is what it does not produce. Drunkenness, carousing, worshiping false gods. These are things that do not have any love for my neighbor. I'll give you an example. Going back to the tattoo, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's say you say it's a sin, and I say it's not. Bear with me on this, okay? Now, let's say I'm going to get a tattoo because I don't think it's wrong. But isn't all the law based on my love for my neighbor and my love for God? How can I say that I love normal when I, I mean, yeah, normal when I do something that I know offends him? And it's caused him to now have, an, have to struggle with something that he wouldn't have had to otherwise. Why don't I just abstain from it in the first place? What is so pressing about tattoos that I have to absolutely get one? And to that I say nothing. That's why I don't have any tattoos. I don't think that it's wrong to get tattoos, but I'm not going to be the reason why other people sin. I also don't believe that it's wrong to drink in moderation. I believe that getting drunk is a sin. Yes, because the Bible says repeatedly, do not get drunk. But I believe that slight amounts of alcohol are not necessarily a sin. However, I do not do it for multiple reasons, actually. Alcohol runs in our family. I'm not going to mess with it. Anything that runs in your family should probably sustain from. Is your mom a gossip? Keep your mouth closed. Do you know what I mean? What, whatever runs in your family, stay away from it. And so I, alcohol runs in my family, so I stay away from it. Second reason is because we deal with people all day 
who can't put their money in their bank account and stop buying beer. All day, every day, we have the same story over and over again. I can't afford this, I can't afford this because I can't stop buying beer. And it's your problem now. So why would I even buy a beer if I'm trying to show them the example of don't be wasteful with your money? What is my purpose? How has God benefited in my action? See what I mean? We need to stop asking, can I do this? Can I get a tattoo? Can I drink? And we ask, should? Should I do this? Is this something that is, is going to benefit God's kingdom? See, we've still got the law mentality. Do's and don'ts. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's about should. Should you do this? That's the big key. You know, I could go out and get drunk tonight and God would still forgive me. Because God's faithful past my stupidity. But that doesn't mean that I should tempt God, does it? Okay. So. When you don't. When you sin, like the booze. Right. You're a stumbling block for somebody who's yep. trying to become a. And he's mentioned that a hundred times. I, I'm glad you brought that up. You become a stumbling block. Go ahead. Uh, it does not say anything in the New Testament about that. And it was Leviticus. Uh, right. That one spot in Leviticus. 19, 20. Right. It does say, uh, from what I looked up on Google, it right. says for the Jews. Right. So the, in the Bible, it is Bible, it doesn't say for the Jews. Well, there's a few things to keep in, keep in mind. The, the law was given to the Jews. So regardless of what it says there, the second thing is that it's surrounded by a bunch of other things that were, once again, pagan practices. So let me make this clearer for you in case you missed Levitic, what Leviticus 19 was trying to tell you. Don't have anything that is a, pa a pagan worship in your home or in your body or on your person or anything. Right. Even today. You know those casino dolls? You got them in your house, get rid of them. Amen. You know those dream catchers? You got them in your house, get rid of them. Don't do anything that pagans do in worship. Right. Stay away from it. Just stay away. Yeah. Evidently, we missed the point. See, we've made it all about an argument about tattoos. Who cares? What he's talking about is do not worship other gods and don't do things that cause other people to go into sin. See what I mean? It, we need to start being smarter. We need to, this is Jesus actually told a parable, a parable about this. It's called the shrewd manager, and he and, and he well, it goes on about the, this this guy how great he was at what he did because he acted so deceitfully. How could God praise that? Because he used his earthly wealth to produce a result. If we would be half that smart, what we were doing, we wouldn't waste our money on things like all those different different things that, that we waste our money on. A carton of cigarettes costs how much? How much? How much? Fifty, sixty bucks. No, just the just the one. Just the one. Oh, one package. Seven dollars and fifty cents. Seven dollars and fifty cents. You can get a pack. I know because somebody I know gets them. Wow. You can get a pack for five fifty. Let's say five. That's the least price. Let, let, let's, let's round it down. Five yeah, bucks. That's how it all. A pack of cigarettes for five bucks. So if you smoke, you're probably gonna go through at least like let's say a pack of what a week maybe. I don't know. Serena, what do you think? Pack how how long for that? A day. A day? Okay. So that's five dollars a day. Five times seven is anyone? Thirty-five dollars. He times that by four and we're over a hundred dollars. On cigarettes. See, it's not about that, it's about being smarter than, than, than sin, being smarter than the world. We've lowered ourselves to a place of stupidity that, that, that we're arguing about pointless things, getting all tipped up about different stuff. We've made pews more important than people being saved. Yeah. Absolutely. We've made music more important than being saved. God came to set people free, and we're still arguing about the law as though Paul never said we're free from it, as though Jesus never said he set people free from it. We're still arguing about pointless things. Why? Why? We're still getting our panties torn up because some stupid people at the WBC decided to go off on a rant about homosexuals rather than just being loving to people. Mm -hmm. The world is going to act stupid. I'm sorry, but they are. Yeah. Then it would be against God's will if I tattooed <coughs> Diana on my, uh, on my shoulder. Right. It would be okay. Right. Uh, and, and I agree with you. Don't worry about the little things. Right. Worry about the big things. Right. Yeah. 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 Y
worry about being saved. Yeah. That's what we're here for, to help people get saved. Yeah. Don't worry about getting tattoos. No. So I think it's Okay, so I think we covered that one. Okay. So, that takes us to the next point. The law can be set aside. Why? Why can the law be set aside? Because it was rooted in a promise which found fulfillment through Christ. That's why the law can be set aside. If it was not founded on a promise, it couldn't have been set aside, could it? We would have been forever under the captivity of sacrificing animals. Luckily, it was not based on itself. It was based on God's character, which never changes, which was personified through the promise and then brought to enrichment in the law and the kingdom and the prophets. And finally, Jesus found his fulfillment. So, hmm. Galatians 3, 17 through 18. Galatians and Romans really answer a lot of the questions that people have about the law today. Yes. Read through there a couple times and you'll start to get what he's saying. Basically, Galatians is this. Stop holding people to the Old Testament law. Stop living for your own desires. That simple. I just summarized all of Galatians in two sentences. Really, it's about more than the law. Galatians 3, 17 through 18 says this. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified or set, set aside, or it doesn't set it aside, ratified by God, um, so as to make the promise void. In other words, just because the law came, it didn't mean that God's promise was held to the law. It meant that the law was held to the promise. Does that make sense? The law was contingent on God's promise of salvation. That means when the promise finally came, it was done with. See what I mean? Read through Galatians and I'll start to go a little bit there. Um, we are under the law of Christ. What, what does that mean? I still have a do and don't list? Well, kind of, but not really. First off, we must love. But here's the here's the kicker. If we truly love, we don't need to be told to love. That's right. In other words, it's not a law to the people who are following it, and it is a law to those people who aren't. So how do you follow it? You submit your life to God. That's it. And as that happens, the law of love throughout through Christ is fulfilled. That's how it is fulfilled. So what do you do when you stumble and, and, and you fall and, and, and you just beat yourself up? You put your faith back in God where it was supposed to be in the first place, and you get back up. It's not about your perfection. You're going to mess up, and it's not the end of the world when you do. Learn something from it, but move on. I see, you know, the most discouraged people I've ever ran into as Christians. The most discouraged people. They act like God is just waiting to squash them. There's a few number of those out there. So... Galatians signs of the Christ, of, of, of Christ's law. First off, in, in other words, Galatians outlines ways that we know that Christ is working in us. Not gratifying the flesh, first off. If we live pleasing to the flesh, I'm going to look at porn because it feels good. I'm going to drink because it feels good. I'm going to go get high because it feels good. Well, you're gratifying the flesh. So that, that would be a sign that you're gratifying the flesh. See what I mean? Uh, the Holy Spirit's uh, work. If the Holy Spirit is working in you, you are changing. He is, he, is, he is molding you into something new. Although it is a slow process, it is still happening. It is a sign uh, that Christ's law is at work within you. Caring for others. Do you pay in tithes? Do, do, you, do you help those people who are within your power to help? Or are you only concerned with yourself and what you can do for you? I don't have a problem with video games, okay? But let me kind of round you guys up on some, some stuff with technology, okay? For a PS4, which is the new game system from Sony, it's going to cost you about $300. Now, for each of those controllers for that game system, it's going to cost you an additional $50. The game console itself usually only comes with one controller, so that means you're going to probably want to buy another one so you can play with friends. You're at $350 plus tax, which means close to $380, but just bear with me. Each game costs $60 plus DLC. We're over $400 to play one game on one console with one friend. 
Now, in order to, to beat these games, you have to spend a lot of time on them to do what's called unlocking trophies, which basically means the more you do, the more the game says, hey, you did it, good job. Or spend $100 to buy the book. Let's go forward to the same process again. So what happens... Excuse me. So what happens is now your life becomes consumed by a video game. Is it wrong to play a video game? No. What is wrong is to let anything help hold you in captivity. What is wrong is to do something that's gratifying the flesh when you think it's wrong for you. See what I mean? Well, I don't think it's right that I'm spending all my day playing this video game, but it feels awful good. What does James say about this? To them who knows that knows it's a sin and still does it. See what I mean? So, moving on. And these other things. Another thing to, to keep in mind is that the Old New Testament does not give exhaustive lists. The law itself is not an exhaustive list, so how much more for Paul's lists? It says in, for instance, uh, 1 Timothy. Yes, 1 Timothy and Titus. It talks about the qualifications for a pastor. Did you know that it's not an exhaustive list? Did you know that neither of those lists conform to each other's lists? When you're picking out a pastor, you don't have to pick someone who does every single thing on that list. He's talking about the idea of the list. You need to find this kind of a person. Because you're not going to find a perfect person to be a pastor. Did you know he's, he makes mistakes? Did you know that? Uh-huh. Did you know that I made mistakes? Did you know that? Yeah. Did you know that I'm still your social pastor and he's still your senior pastor? Did you know that when we mess up, you, we're still the authority in the church? That's the way that the church is set up. See what I mean? We're not going to be sinless. However, you should give thought to the content of a person's heart before you put them in leadership. I see some people put people in leadership because they want them to stay in the church. Paul said, don't do that. This is the kind of person that you need to have in your leadership position. They need to be this kind of a person. It says in one part, for instance, it says, man, he should only have one wife. But you know that polygamy back in his day was extremely rare? The, the, the Greek wording says it like this. He, he should be a one-woman man. In other words, he should have his heart set on his wife and not on someone else's wife. See what I mean? That's what Paul's talking about. You should have somebody in leadership that doesn't have to drop his pants every single time that a pretty thing walks by. See what I mean? That's the kind of a person you need to put in leadership. Self-control, discipline, that's the kind of person you need. You don't need someone who goes out and gets drunk every other week. You don't need someone who doesn't live his life as an example, puts on his pastor robes one day and takes them off the next. You don't need that. That's not a leader. You need a leader who, who, who has this kind of content. And that's what he's talking about. He's not giving a new law in the, in the New Testament. He's just simply giving the content of what you should be looking for in your leaders. Anyways, <clears throat> we can still learn from the law. Just because we do not have to follow the law does not mean that just because we are we are not Israel and does not directly uh, it does not directly have bearings over over us anymore does not mean that we cannot learn from it. Paul already said in Second Timothy that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for yes. our teaching, for our instruction, so that we could be made perfect. Okay, so. <clears throat> The law is not a diet. Some people have gone through Exodus and said, I'm going to eat like this because this is God's perfect diet. Eh, wrong. The law was not given for a diet. It was to bring people into, back into proper restoration with God. Okay. Second, it is not a promise to America or any current nation. It was given to the people of Israel for a limited time. However, with that being said, when we submit our lives to God, when we seek God, he does still bless us because he's good. Not because we deserve it, just because he's looking for someone to bless. There was this episode of Malcolm in the Middle. And Francis, if you know the characters, Francis is the oldest son, and uh, Reese is the second, and then uh, Malcolm is the third. They're all on the roof, and they've got these water balloons filled with all kinds of gross stuff. They got the, the, gut, the stuff in the gutters. They got uh, stuff from toilets. I mean, they just packed this stuff with gross stuff. Coloring dye, all kinds of gross stuff. Okay? Then they just looked for someone to, who to shoot it at. Because they had this, this really powerful shooter. They had one guy holding this side, they had the other guy holding this side, and they had one guy pulling it back real far. And they were shooting people blocks away. And they were just having a good old time. But there comes a, there is this one part where they, where they can't find anyone to shoot it at. Like, who do we shoot it at? 
That's God with blessings. He's just looking for someone to pour it out on. It's not like he's, he's wanting to withhold all kinds of goodness from you. He wants to pour out blessings on you. He's looking. He's looking to pour out blessings. Yes. Think of a boss who, had, who decided, I, you know, I have too much money. Who can I give this money to? And so he goes out and finds one of his employers and says, hey, you, you're doing your job. Have a bonus. He said, think beyond financial terms. God blesses us in many ways, and financial is probably the worst way that God can bless us. <laughs> you hear what I said? I know it's the way that you, we oftentimes turn to the first, but if God were to give us finances, it would ruin us. Ruin us. Ruin us. Okay? God's blessings are way better than money. Way better than money. For instance, did you know that I was used in a word last Sunday in the gifts of the Spirit? Yes. I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade any amount of money for that. No. Yes. See what I mean? Real blessings versus what people say you need. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to the to the worship team about this. Sometimes we get our hope set on the thing. Like for instance, I can't afford next month's rent. So God, I pray that you would you would give me the, the next month's rent. When this is how we when this is instead how we should understand it, because we start worrying about it, right? Even if I lose the house, God. Mm-hmm. Come on. Even if I lose the house. See what I mean? Because our faith isn't in the money, is it? It's not in the next mortgage payment. We could be living on the streets and God would still be with us. Because God is a God who is comforting, who is patient, and who goes with his children wherever they are drawn to. So anyways. So. It is not a promise to America or any other current nation. Um... It is not timeless instructions for meat processing. I was talking to somebody, and they said they only butcher their animals a certain way because of what the books of the law said. What? What? It's not, a, it's not instructions for how to process meat. Um, it is not complete. Did you know, for instance, that the law doesn't say anything at all about um, child molestation? Did you know that? Why? Because the law wasn't meant to be complete. It was meant to show people sin. It's not an exhaustive list, once again. But now we don't have to worry about it because the Holy Spirit impresses on our heart and changes us as we submit our lives to him. Amen. See? God. It's beyond the law. We've gotten to something better than the law. Um, okay. Um, it is also not for us to follow today. I just mentioned that. However, we can still get principles and ideas from it. It is not a metaphor. I, oh, my God. I was talking to somebody, right? And they had the whole Old Testament law figured out. To the, how many tent pegs were put into a tent were, were, were metaphors for something later. Like, oh, well, tents, they normally have, like, what, four pegs in them in the four corners? That must stand for four of the disciples who would. It's like, what? I mean, it's not some long metaphor. It, there is something called foreshadowing, which I've already talked about, so I'm not going to get into it. Um, Okay, the law was not nullified because of Israel's failures, but because it was insufficient. In other words, God did not give up on the promise because Israel failed to follow his law. God gave the law temporarily for a, for a guide to them, and then when the, time of, 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 when the time was fulfilled, he cast it aside because it was no longer necessary. Does that make sense? So, the law was nullified because, or uh, negated, or uh, destroyed, or made obsolete, or um, canceled, uh, because of Israel's failure, but because it was insufficient. The law was never meant to be sufficient for us. Christ was meant to be the only sufficient thing for us. See, they had to look forward to Christ, we had to look back to Christ. The law does not still work for Israel, they are living in sin by following it. When you do any work with the idea that you are earning your salvation or keeping your salvation, you are wrong in living in sin. Because what has happened is you have placed, placed your faith in the work rather than in the God of the work. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, there are not two people of God, the Jew and the Gentile. There's one people of God. Yeah. He, gave, he, he, made Jew, and he, he called Jews to be his people and then... He expanded it to reach out to all Gentiles because the Jews just didn't really take it past their own borders. Um, however, that was God's plan anyways to bring it to all people. So, um, so there are not two, two, people of, two people of God. 
God's promise was enriched by first the law, after the promise the law was given, and then the kingdom was given. He, prom- he made a promise to David that through his, his heir, uh, this uh, salvation would come, and that was in Jesus. Um, then he enriched it through the prophets, giving us more more uh, wisdom and more ways to understand him. And then finally, through Christ and the, give, and the giving of the Holy Spirit, um, we are grafted into the branch. We are part of true Israel, those who seek God. Does that make sense? Yeah. True Israel is not someone who is circumcised. It is someone who seeks after God. It is God's people. There's only one people of God, now Jew and Gentile. Okay. Once again, people get a little bit confused about that. Um, so we're going to look at look at some some things here very quickly, and then we'll be done. Leviticus chapter thirteen, because you know I thought, why just tell you about the law and not actually look at the law? So I told you about the law, and now we're going to look at the law too. Leviticus thirteen, we're not going to read the whole thing. Don't worry. I know everybody just said, mm. we're not going to read the whole thing. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a person has on the skin of his body a swelling or an eruption or a spot, and it turns into a case of leprous disease on the skin of his body, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons the priest, and the priest shall examine the diseased area on the skin of his body. And if the hair in the diseased area has turned white, and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a case of leprous disease. When the priest has examined him, he shall pronounce him unclean. But if the spot is white in the skin of his body, it appears no deeper than the skin, and the hair in it has not turned white, the priest shall shut up the diseased person for seven days. And the priest shall examine him on the seventh day, and if in his eyes the disease is checked and, it, and the disease has not spread in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up for another seven days. So what's the first thing to know? They didn't have doctors in modern medicine like we do today, right? The same thing to notice is that they had to be what's called ritually pure. In other words, they had to present themselves in such a way just to be able to offer sacrifices. Does that make sense? And they had to offer the sacrifices to be in communion with God. All that was done away with was Jesus. Because he's our sacrifice and he's our priest. Make sense? And he dwells in us, so it's no longer about what disease we have on our outside skin. Okay? So... But however, uh, and so they had to do, they had to follow these certain ways to, to have God dwell with them. So then, what has changed? We don't have a priest. God, Jesus is our priest. Second, we don't have to follow. We don't have to sacrifice animals. Uh, third, we don't have to be ritually pure. We do have to submit our lives to God. But we don't have to dress a certain way, do a certain thing to be. To, we don't have to do any of that. Okay. So, um, what has stayed the same? See, this is where people get a little lost. What has stayed the same? Don't share your illness. Well, if it is not what comes and goes into our mouth that defiles us, what comes out, we could say something like this. When you sin, go to your great high priest, who is Jesus, and confess your sins to him. Not to, not to a pastor, to God. Okay. All right. And then we are still called to, to 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 seek after Him and to be in communion with Him, right? Yes. So then that takes us to so how does this passage apply to me today? Well, strap on your boots, kiddos. Um, first off, here all are susceptible to sin. That's the first thing we can understand from this passage. How, does anybody did anybody pay attention to what he, how the chapter started up? up? The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, when a person has on, has on the skin of his body, when a person, at random times, disease is going to pop up in people. And the same is true for sin. Sure. Did you know that it's not, I'm a good person, Lord, you're going to be my example. And Lord is a bad person. So I'm not going to do sin because I'm an associate pastor, but Lord, because she's lower than me, she's going to fall to sin. So when she falls to sin, no, it doesn't say that, does it? It says, when a person... Okay. So that's the first thing we can learn. All are susceptible to sin, and all are just susceptible to disease. Fact. It doesn't matter how holy your faith is. Uh, my mom's, if it's my great grandpa, it's, no. Your yeah, your grandpa. My mom's grandpa died of cancer, and he planted a bunch of churches. Oh well, that's not right. All are susceptible to sin. Leviticus 13 just taught us that. I mean, that's disease. I'm sorry, disease. Well, there was a pastor on the news who sent, who, who, who fell to adultery. Yeah, you caught the one. 
It's not really, <laughs> that's really not that way. See, sometimes we think that all pastors are doing it because a few are. Well, no. There are some pastors who are doing that. Mm-hmm. Not all of them are. And did you know that it doesn't mean that his whole ministry was a sham? Amen. It doesn't mean that. That's right. What it means is that he fell to sin because all are susceptible to sin. Leviticus 13.1 just taught us that. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? This, is, this would be how to correctly apply the Leviticus to today. Let's go a step further. Sin spreads to others and must be confessed to our priest, Jesus. Sin spreads to others. This is a two-part. Sin spreads to others. I'll give you an example. Vicki, you're going to be my scapegoat on this one, okay? I have gotten angry at Jimmy. So I'm going to go over to Vicki and tell her how upset at Jimmy I am. See, my, my sin just spread, didn't it? I'll give you, I'll give you more examples. I've decided that my money is my own business, and God can have his Sunday, and he can have his tithes, and that's about it. Just about it. So I'm going to go out and spend my money however I want. And then other people are going to see me and see that I go to this church. And other people who are saved who are struggling are going to see me. See what I mean? So first part, sin spreads to others. Indirectly and directly. Saying that must be confessed to our priest, Jesus. What happens when you mess up? You repent to the Lord and you ask for forgiveness. Yes. You don't have to get saved all over again. But you do have to confess your sins. Because you're saved. It's not like you, the only way you can lose your salvation is if you just give it up. God, I'm not following you anymore. That's that. That's losing your salvation. You can't, it, God's salvation is not this, this piece of glue that's constantly slipping through our fingers. Or jello. I like jello better. This piece of jello that's slipping through our fingers. No, it's not like that. So, uh, what else can we learn from this? We don't have to wait. We're, go ahead. I didn't think. Is it biblical that you can't lose your salvation? Yes. Hebrews talks about this too. Okay. Okay. Please. If you're curious about it, what's the, not tomorrow, next Sunday evening, I'm going to talk about the unforgivable sin, and I'll mention it then, okay? Um, I taught Yams about it in Hebrews. Uh, we'll, we'll get into it later. Um, and I also talked about it again two weeks ago with that, remember that? Or three. It doesn't matter. Um, anyways, and it, if you're curious about normal, normal until next Sunday, because I'm not preaching on it until next Sunday. If you can't wait, talk to Pastor. If you still can't wait, read Hebrews and what's the other one? And Matthew. Hebrews and Matthew. Okay. And those explain. It. All right. Now, but once again, I'll, I'll talk to you about it next Sunday night, night too, if, just in case. Uh, we don't have to wait. We can seek them now. Whereas before, for the case of ritual purity, they had to wait for certain times. For instance, after a woman had a baby, she had to wait over a month, sometimes over two months, depending on what sex the baby was, before she could go and go to the tent, to the priest and offer a sacrifice. She couldn't even go into the courts to offer the sacrifice, though. She had to stay outside until it was sacrificed. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to wait. We can seek him right now. If you're, in, if you're stuck in sin today, it's the day of salvation. Yes, right. No more ritual purity. You don't have to worry about it. Confess your sins and come to the Father. That way. Just like that. As soon as you confess, he's faithful and just to hear you, hear you and restore you. Yes. That way. We don't have to worry about ritual purity anymore. And you know what? If you're not circumcised, it doesn't matter either. So, correction must come, though. Sometimes God still does bring things that don't seem like, but God, I, I repented. Well, we just saw it from Leviticus 13, though, that sometimes it still comes. Um, if I see what... Um, in verse 3, 13, 3. And the priest shall examine the diseased area on the skin of his body, and if the hair in it, um, in the diseased area, has turned white, and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, is a case of leprous disease. When the priest has examined him, he shall pronounce him unclean. But then it says later, if this isn't the case, he shall pronounce him clean. But then in the next chapter, it says that he still has to go through the modes of uh, offering a sacrifice to purify himself from this unclean disease that he had. So we see that there are still results, aren't there? Corrections may still come when we, are, when we fall, fall to sin. Sometimes God doesn't, but sometimes he still does. Um, sin has to be dealt with before we can be restored to God and he will receive our offerings. If you look at... Um, for, chapter 14, verses 2 through 3. Look what it says. This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, 
And the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then if the case of leprous disease is healed in the leprous person. Did you catch that? Mm-hmm. His sin has to be dealt with before we can be restored to God. Before they could offer the sacrifice, the priest had to check them. Before we are restored in our relationship to God, our priest has to check us, doesn't he? We have to confess our sins to our great high priest, Jesus. And then after that, we will be restored to God. We, can't, we cannot be restored to God if there is no repentance. That's why, people, that's why you aren't automatically saved when you die. Because there can be no restoration if there was no repentance. Does that make sense? And once again, these are, these are ways that, the, that the Leviticus actually applies to us. It still is a powerful book, isn't it? Can you see how some of these things ended up found their way into Paul's letters? Yeah. You can see that, can't you? And into the, into John's letters too. Jesus saving us do not, does not permit us to let sin run rampant in us. Now, didn't we just read that in Paul's letters? Yeah. But here we are in Leviticus 13, and we found it again, don't we? Leviticus 13:8. For instance, there's other parts I could have turned to. Um, and the priest shall look, and if the eruption has spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a leprous disease. See, Jesus saving us does not permit us to let sin rampant in us, sin run rampant in us. There is a difference between sin that is an eruption and sin which leads to sin. Now, some of you might say, what? Go read the gospel, not the gospel, the letter of John, 1 John. And he says this very same thing in chapter 5, the last chapter. He says this. No, I don't want to read it. No, I don't. I want to read it. <laughs> Last chapter of 1 John. 1 John. Um, where is it? <laughs> Is there a chapter 6? There's not. Where is it? Oh, okay, right here. I'm sorry, right there. If anyone, chapter 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death. How can sin not lead to death? Doesn't all sin separate us from God? Because some sins are eruptions. So did you read what Le- Leviticus just said? If it was just an eruption of the skin, they're clean, let them do their thing. Sin is the exact same way. Sometimes someone will just have an eruption of sin in their life. They won't be giving, giving themselves over to sin. They will stumble for a short time. Be patient with them. And then what does he tell us to do when that happens? Sin leading to death. He shall ask, and God will give him life. In other words, pray for the one that you see messing up. But don't write him off. Um, and God will give him life. For those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. Um, there is sin that leads to death. I do not see that, that, uh, that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Well, we just found out in Leviticus, huh? There is a difference between a sin that is an eruption, a temporary thing, and a sin that leads to more sin, right? I'll give you an example. I will give you a perfect example. There, let's say there's a person who's practicing in the church and they won't repent. So then they have to do more things to solidify their argument that they are right and you are wrong. And then they'll do more things. And then their heart will grow harder. And then they'll do more things. And you don't, can't do anything to bring them to repentance. Why? Because their sin led them to more sin. It wasn't an eruption of sin, like, like Leviticus 13 was talking about. It was full-on hardcore leprosy. So we are done. This is, if you guys are curious about that little thing that I said, there it is written out for you. What did it mean to them back then? What has changed? Um, sorry, I was supposed to say, what has changed? Um, actually, just what has changed. What is the same, and what does this mean for me today? Four easy steps to apply any passage of the law to today. It's that easy. Yep. Basically, you look, okay, what does this mean to them back then? Then you say, okay, well, what about Jesus? What changed and what's the same based off of that? Yeah. Then you say, okay, so how does this apply to me today? <clears throat> how? I'll give you an application. Diana, you're now my scapegoat. Diana is, Diana is, a, is, a, is a rabid gossip. She gossips about everyone. See what I mean? So, that's it. She's just a gossip. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
Um, okay, so what did Leviticus 13 just tell us about that? You need to confess your sins. <laughs> see what I mean? But what happens if it's a deep-rooted sin, a sin that is not just an eruption, a sin that leads to more sin? What does it say to do to that person? Don't associate with them. They are unclean. If there is someone in your fellowship that is a constant gossip, do not hang out with them. And if you are that person, close your mouth. That is how the biggest 13 applies to you today. I just gave you an application. Now, let's say your problem isn't gossiping. There's still a lot of other things. Complaining, hoarding, lust. I mean, you go down the list. So anyways, are there any questions then? Any questions? Hopefully that, that gives you a small glimpse into the law. The law is really one of my favorite parts. I know the whole thing is my favorite part. And um, it's just hard to understand sometimes. Huh? Well, hopefully that will help. Uh, can I get um, someone who looks holier than me? <laughs> Sandy, could you pray for me? I'm just kidding. I don't know. Thank you that you gave us Jesus to free us to walk in victory over that law and to walk in the freedom that God you gave us through your son. Thank you. We praise and honor you for that. Help us each day to lean into your Holy Spirit tonight that we are led in the pathways you choose and the way you want us to see others and the way you want us to be. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. 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 Amen.